Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Praise God. I'm bringing a young man up here to the pulpit. When I saw him walk in, I said, he's got some gray hair up there, Lord. He's getting great too. Amen. I appreciate this, man. I love Brother Morgan, don't you? How many really forgot to do just one more thing right now this afternoon? Isaiah chapter number 14, I begin reading with verse number 12. I thought as the service progressed that there is two elements that's here. There are some that are young and ready for the battle, full of vigor, ready to charge hell. And there are some that are here that have been in the midst of the battle, and they've come weary and worn. Amen. But I believe the Lord is here to gather us together. Amen. All I know is that let God arise and His enemies be scattered. Praise God. This is the greatest hour to be a part of the church there ever was. Amen. It don't matter if you're just getting in the battle or you've been in for a while. One thing we're assured of today is the church is destined for victory. Well, you were shouting a while ago. I don't know where your shout went. Amen. Brother Kraft preached it so capably that uh, you just got to have faith in God. doesn't matter what's going on around about you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what any other voice is saying to you. You've got to learn that whatever God has said, He is able to perform. And He's going to do exactly as He has spoken. Well, praise God. Isaiah chapter number 14, and I will also be going to the book of Jude. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heavens, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Amen. That's the only thing he could try to be is like him, because he sure can't be him. Because there's only one God. Amen. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did... Shake kingdoms. Amen. The book of Jude. Chapter number 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity, or as would originally say, the word spots there is not the way we view it, but it's actually talking about something that's hidden, hidden rocks under the surface of water. These are things that are hidden. These are things that you don't see in your feast of charity or when you observe the Lord's Supper. And they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, puffed up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Amen. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Amen. 
Uh, you know, you come to a meeting like this, there's so much that you want to say and you want to preach. And and uh, I was talking with the Shatwell this morning, and and uh, I could relate a little bit of crap last night because you know you want to you want to preach something, and they, this is what you want to say. And the Holy Ghost, it it knows every need in a building. Amen. And it knows the need in this place right now. And so, if you're really, really involved in the work of God like you should be, then you understand it's not about uh, razzle-dazzle and impressing people with oratory or your great sermon. Well, praise God. But it's about ministering to the needs of people that are there. People that have come, as I've already said, worn and weary of battle, but they're still in the heat of it, but yet they've come today for strength and to be replenished. Amen. I heard somebody say a long time ago, it's nothing wrong with getting weary in the battle, just don't get weary of the battle. Amen. I want to preach today on the subject, <clears throat> Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Amen. I really feel the help of the Holy Ghost in this place right now. Amen. Anybody going to help me preach here for a few minutes? Praise God. Anybody interested in the will of God being done here right now? <clears throat> Praise God. <clears throat> amen, amen, amen. Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you for standing. Amen. I, uh, I've tried to figure out and to uh, uh, try to analyze the the nature and and the reasoning of Lucifer, Amen. How that somebody who was created with such uh, greatness to hold the position that he held, I first of all believe that Lucifer was created with the intent and the will of God to do exactly as he is doing right now, Amen. I don't think that God made a mistake. I don't think that God woke up one morning in heaven and thought, I've got a problem on my hands and I've got a rebellion here and I've got to do something. Amen. I believe before Lucifer was ever created that God knew exactly what he was doing and why he created him. Amen. The only way for you to truly understand God is for there to be something opposite to bring contrast to it. In other words, you could never know the healing power of God unless you know sickness. You can never know that God is a way maker until you have stood at the Red Sea. You will never know that God is a deliverer until you have tried all of the things that you know to try and you are feeling hopeless and abandoned until you understand that with God there is nothing impossible and that God can take you through any situation. Amen. Jesus told Simon Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. And we have preached it, and rightfully so, that that's the rock of revelation, the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And I do believe that. But I also believe it's further than just the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. The church is built upon the revelation of God. Amen. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The reason why hell cannot prevail against the church is because whatever hell concocts to throw at the church, God is there to reveal himself to be the opposite of it and to show you that he can take you through any situation. Instead of complaining about our situation, we need to learn how to rejoice in the fact that God has chosen this to reveal something about himself to me. Therefore, I will not grumble. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to murmur. I'm going to thank God that through the midst of this trial or sickness or situation that God is revealing himself to me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I believe that the devil was the choir director of heaven. I believe he was the worship leader of heaven. The Bible talks about his workmanship and 
things that he was created with and the tapestry and the pipe. And when you study it, run it all down, the timbrel and the instruments used to play for dancing. I believe that he led the angelic host before the throne of God and the light of God, which is the word, would shine upon him and fill heaven with the rainbow of brilliance and color and I believe that he was the anointed cherub that covereth, and he was anointed for specific purposes and reasons. Amen. Everything that God creates, he creates according to his divine order. Everything that God does, he does with something that is specific in mind. When Luke picks up the writing to the church and the writing about the Acts of the Apostles, he addresses Theophilus, and he begins to pick back up on the order of God. And he talks about the former treatise, have I written unto thee, O Theophilus, of the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Everything that God does has a divine order and purpose accompanied with it. Amen. I've got news for some of you here today. You are not here by accident. You are not here by just some mere something taking place. But you are here by the divine will and purpose of Almighty God. We're going to have to wake up and realize that God did not want us back with the apostles. And God didn't want us in the book of Acts. He wanted us in 1999. He wanted us right where we're at. He wanted us in this moment and in this hour. And it's time for us to realize that God doesn't just fling us out here somewhere with some deism theory. But God, through His order, has chosen every person that's in this building this afternoon. You are here by the divine divine appointment of God. That's how come you will not fail, but you will succeed. That's how come that God has said, you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you. You've got to understand, I am here today by divine mandate and appointment by God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. God didn't need the Apostle Paul in 1999. He needed you in 1999. He didn't need Simon Peter here in this hour. He saved the best for last. And just as much as he took time to choose those who would start the church, I got news for you. He didn't get sloppy when he came to the end of this dispensation. He knew who could get the job done. He knew your talents. He knew your abilities. He knew your weaknesses. He knew everything about you. But he saves you for this hour. He puts you into his order. He puts you into his divine purpose. You need to get that devil off your back. You need to tell him he's a liar. Greater is he that's within me than he that is in the world. God has chosen me for this hour. Hallelujah. Amen. <coughs> Isaiah records, Tessa reveals, and it kind of, you have to understand how he's writing and what he's saying. He talks about a man and he talks about a king and then he talks about Lucifer and the nature of Lucifer and the nature of Satan that begins to develop itself inside of a man. He talks about these things and he said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, or prince of the new day? Amen. He said, I, I, I heard you say that you would exalt your throne above the stars of God. Every time you read and everything that he says here in Isaiah, it's always, I will exalt and I will ascend and I will be like. Amen. I'm telling you, mark it down. Anything the devil tells you, you're basically going to get the opposite of it. That's how come I believe that when he talked to these angels to rebel, I believe that he promised them liberty. I believe he told them that this God that you serve is too confining. And if you'll follow me, I'll liberate you and set you free. Amen. I got news for you. The devil never set anybody free. He doesn't have the power to set you free. All he's got is a lie. And the only thing you can do is believe a lie and be damned. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I will, I will, I will, I will. And God said, you're not doing anything that you said. 
He said, when I get through with you, and by the time I cast you down, he said, the world's going to walk by you and narrowly look upon you and say, you've got to be kidding. This is the one that shook nations. This is the one that struck tear in the hearts of kings. You, you, you've got to be joking. This, this little something, this insignificant something is the one that did this. One of the greatest things the devil has is to get your focus off of God and to let, make you look at him and the more you look at him, the bigger he gets. Amen. That's why you need to keep your eyes focused. You need to set your faith on he who is not just the author, but the finisher of it. The more you look at Christ, the bigger he gets. Oh, come magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We've not come into this meeting to talk about how big and bad the devil is. We've come to lift up the name of Jesus. We've come to exalt him on high. Let God arise in this place and our enemies will be scattered praise God praise God I want you to notice what got Lucifer in trouble the Bible says that he makes mention that he would exalt his throne above the stars of God all of a sudden he is not content with his position in God's divine order. He wants to move himself out of where God put him. He has decided that this is not big enough. It's not grand enough. It's not great enough. He forgot that we serve a God that understands all things put him in his rightful position. But he decides that I do not want to maintain this. I want to move from this position. And I will sit upon the sides of the congregation in the north. I refuse to stay where God put me. Amen. He moved out of his place seeking a position from pride. Refused to remain where God put him desired a position to ascend. And I got news for you. Anytime you start wanting to ascend above your peers, you are on your way to a fall. Well, I hit something right there. Amen. Anytime you decide you're better than everybody else and you don't need everybody else, I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you can preach. I don't care if you cast devils out. I don't care if you can raise the dead. Pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. I will never forget this a little lady that I think a lot of and has been very instrumental in my life and others. And if I called her name, some of you were very familiar with her. I'll never forget, she called me one day and said, Brother Morgan, I want to tell you a little quote. And I said, all right. She said, don't ever forget this. She said, at the, pro at the intersection of pride and fleshly ambition is the scene of terrible destruction. Amen. She said, you've got to seek Jesus and Him first. Everything that you do, she said, if you build your ministry around what men say about you and the way that they use you, she said, there'll come a day that men will use you and then they'll cast you aside. She said, but if you build upon the fact that it's in Jesus Christ, I rest my ministry. She she said, it doesn't matter what men do. It doesn't matter what men say. You've built upon the right foundation. Amen. I'm telling you, when pride enters your heart and it becomes your ambition and your drive and where you want to go and what you want to do and you are not content to stay in your position that God has placed you in, you're on your way to a fall. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care how much anointing you felt. I don't. You can't get much more anointed than Lucifer. He was the anointed chair that covereth. But when he decided, God didn't know what he was doing when he put me here. I'm bigger than this. I'm greater than this. I can exalt myself. I got news for you. You're on your way down just like the devil. And when the world gets through looking at you, it won't be glory. They'll look at you in shame. He said, I will exalt. I desire something bigger. I'm not talking about faith. I'm not talking about things that God has showed you for the kingdom. I'm talking about fleshly ambitions and fleshly desires 
and assassinating somebody to step over them because you think if you say something about you know what you putting out somebody else's candle doesn't make yours burn any brighter Submit yourself, therefore, to God as your first priority, and then you're to submit yourself to your brother. And sometimes we have trouble with that. And Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will move out of my course and my position, and I will exalt to be like the Most High God. Amen. Jude picks it up in his writings, and he talks, and he begins to make comparison. And I want you to notice, and I'm laying the foundation here just for a second. I want you to notice some of the things that Jude says in verse number 6. He said, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness until the judgment of that great day. I also want you to notice in verse number 13, when he talks about wandering stars, he said, To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. When God created these angels, Brother Clark, He created them and compared them to stars. I understand that you could take this and, and do word study on it and sometimes stars and the different interpretations of it, but I want you to see it in its rightful setting. He compared them to stars, fixed points of light, things that God put in His own divine order. But somehow Lucifer deceives a third of these stars into believing that they could move out of their habitation and could move out of their estate or where God has placed them and would exalt and ascend. And when they moved out of their position, they eternally have wandered in darkness since. No direction. No set course. Wandering from here to there, from there to here. Praise God. Jude picks it up. And he begins to make comparison to these angels, to men. He said men, he said, who ran after through greed, ran after the gain or the heir of Balaam and the gainsaying of Korah. Let me preach what I feel here this afternoon. Amen. Men, he said, who are, he said, they're hidden things to cause you to shipwreck at the Lord's Supper. Men, he said, who were determined of old. He began to talk about them. He said, foaming waves of the sea. And he said, but not only that, but they are wandering stars who reserve the blackness of darkness forever. Amen. I'm telling you that once you move out of that fixed position by God, where do you stop? I have watched them great stars. Bright stars, Brother Clark. Tremendous stars. I mean burning stars. Amen. When they preached, you felt the anointing of God upon their lives. But somehow, in some way, one of the oldest tricks, even Lucifer fell to it, pride. And all of a sudden, uh, the setting is not big enough. Or the organization is not big enough. Or our crowds aren't big enough. Or our offerings aren't large enough. And the next thing you know, they have decided that they're above all of this. Well, praise God. They don't have to stay in this small environment. After all, if you can only appreciate the ministry that they had, and, and you don't appreciate it, and it's bigger than this, and it's too confining, and there's too much bondage, and there's too many rules, and there's too much legislation, and I can't build what God wants me to build. But all this confining. I can't do the will of God set in this box and, and these boundaries. I'm much bigger than this. And, and if I could just be free from this, you, you don't appreciate my ministry. You don't know what it is. And I could do so much more and I could turn the world upside down. I got news for you, my friend. Wherever God puts you as a star, it doesn't matter what you think about it. You have one divine priority. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. You better stay wherever God puts you. And I got news for you, and I want to say it loud, and I want to say it clear. Holiness is not a box, and holiness is not bondage. It is the perfect law of liberty. It's not legislation. 
You don't set anybody free when you chuck it all out the door. I tell you what happens to you. You start moving like a wandering star. Where do you stop? I hardly ever preach like I'm about to preach in a meeting, but I feel it getting on me right now. Amen. Amen. You start looking at everything that's been taught and everything that's been preached. And you start questioning everything. Amen. It, 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 you see, my ministry is bigger than this. And, and, and my church is bigger than this. And that, 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 oh, yeah, that's for some of you ignorant folks and some of you folks that don't know any better. And, and I mean, after all, the, the well, I don't know how to say this without sounding insulting, but, you know, I mean, the more carnal and the less educated people are, the more they have to have restrictions. And that's the new argument now. Don't you understand? The less disciplined the man is, and he's raised in a dysfunctional environment. Yes, he has to have more rules. But if you've really got your act together, and if you're really smart, and if you're really disciplined, you don't have to have all these rules. Sounds like Lucifer to me. You stars need to stay where you're at. But I'm bigger than this. I'm like God. Amen. I got my act together. I got it all put together. Amen. And so the next thing you know is, is uh, well, you know, after all, I mean, it, it's okay for us to get rid of some of these things. They're a little confining and they put us too much in a box. I've preached in churches. I've been called to come to churches where the pastor all of a sudden woke up and said, I've made a terrible mistake. What I thought would bring me to liberty has brought me into bondage. Because, Brother Clark, once we start giving people liberty to indulge in the flesh, they are subject to no law. I stood in the pulpit a few months ago with what used to be one of the largest churches in our fellowship. Pastor asked me to come, called the district superintendent. He said, Yeah, I want you to go. Maybe you can help him. And I'd gained favor with the pastor and, and the church way out. And I stood there. They, I sat on the front pew that night in the service. And I had a friend with me there and my family. And, and uh, with the clerk, I'm telling you, as the song service started, the choreographer dancers come in. And, and even the pastor's daughters were there in their blue jeans and, and their tops. And they begin to dance. It wasn't under the Holy Ghost. It was, it was trained and orchestrated. It was choreography. And they begin to dance and do whatever. And, and uh, indecent. And also ungodly and indecent. And I sat there thinking, my God, what happens? What happens in the thinking of a man? What happens? And, and, and after service, the man made statement to me. He said, God spoke to me that I'm to go this way because UPC is in bondage. And if I go this way, I can make a way for everybody else to come. And, and the brethren are going to follow me. And I told him, I said, i got news for you. If you think we're coming where you're at, I said, I hate to tell you, but you're badly deceived. We're not coming this way. We're not going this way. It's just settled. We're not going this way. And I'm sorry that you somehow you got deceived into your mind into thinking that this place that God put you... Boy, I want the Holy Ghost to help me preach right now. This position that God put you in is not big enough to contain your ministry or your revelation or your spiritual gifts. But I got news for you. Wherever God puts you, you better not question it. You just better shine... You better twinkle, little stars, what you better do. You better not get that pride in your heart to think, I can exalt above this. I'm bigger than this. You're not bigger than God. Woo! And, you know, we, we don't need this. And, and uh, we, you know, I mean, Paul said for a woman to cut her hair is a shame, not a sin. What kind of ignoramus would even think something like that? Who would even want to bring shame to her head, especially to God? What's wrong with our thinking? And, and you know, a little worldliness doesn't hurt. I mean, after all, we do things in moderation. See, that's the problem. We've not taught our people moderation. I would agree in certain areas of that, but we've not taught them moderation. And I agree that we can't legislate everything. And I'll be the first one to tell you, it's not coming out of a rule book where we've made a terrible mistake. Is we've tried to enforce things just out of enforcing it instead of telling people, you're going to have to get you a relationship with God and understand the nature of God's what you're going to have to do.
I don't need somebody standing over me with a gun to my head telling me I gotta live like this. I tell you what makes me live like this. Every time I have a good prayer meeting and get in the presence of a holy God and I come out of there, I say, God, I have a long way to go to be like you. I don't need to be reverting back to the old man. I need to be continuously changed from glory to glory into your likeness and into your image. Yes, I agree on all this technology and stuff. And yes, somehow we've got to get a hold of God through it all. We've got to understand that God has got to help us. I can't force it. I can't make you do it. But i tell you what I can do. If I can get you in the presence of God long enough. If I can get you talking to God. If I can get you in the relationship with God. If I can get you to want to be like Him. Well, you know, we don't, we don't need to do this, and this is okay, and as long as you do it in moderation. Somebody told me that the other day, and I said, well, that's the case, we'll all go out and commit adultery, just as long as we do it in moderation. I said, that's how stupid that argument makes. What do you think grace is for, that you go out here and just continue in sin? Paul said, God forbid. Don't take the grace of God out of a liberty to live your own licentious lifestyle, to do whatever you want, and then say you're covered by grace. The very word grace teaches you. What are you saved from? What did grace keep you from? And all of a sudden they decide we, we don't need this. And they move. But once they move, what they don't understand is, I called and checked on this. I wanted to make sure. There's what they call in the heavens and galaxies. It's a black hole. And I, I talked to the scientist about all this, and, and I said, I'm, I'm preaching a sermon, and I want you to tell me. And he said, Reverend, what happens is, is he said, after a star burns out, he said, they have they don't permeate energy anymore. And he said, there's, there's still gold in the heavens, a black hole. And he said, actually what it is is energy in reverse. It's not pushing out energy. It's drawing energy. And he said, these stars that he said, we call them falling stars. He said, uh, after they burned out, lost their energy, he said, this negative force begins to pull them. And he said, things that we see, he said, it's been going on for thousands of years. He said, these stars are wondering. But actually, in their wondering, they are being drawn, he said, to an eternity of darkness. And what happens to a man as long as he stays in the Word? His energy is there. But the moment he starts stepping out of the Word, something begins to reverse. And where does he stop? Oh, it's just a few little things that don't matter. And it progressively keeps on until where now it's the doctrine. You know, oh, I'm not violating the doctrine. See, what people fail to understand is separation is a doctrine all the way from the Old Testament. I heard Brother Holly say one time, he said, all of the doctrines of the Scripture are like a fine woven tapestry and make up one brilliant picture and color. And he said, but once you start pulling one strand out of it, it all begins to unravel. And so what happens is, is the moment that you move out of what gives you your energy, you start wondering. What well, sounds negative here to make that? Just wondering. This is not wrong anymore. This is okay now. And there is no stopping now. You're wondering. Falling stars. Oh, it's heavy right now. Heavy. Anybody know what I'm talking about right now? You, you, can you... I, I'm not saying this to glory in it, but when I preach something like this, even when I preach, I think of men that I know. That I've admired. I've never been so hurt by the car. The man that I used to think was so. I, I remember an incident, I won't even go into it. But man, when I heard this man make some statements, it was when in the pulpit, it was with some other men. I, I oh, I, I, I was so shaken. I thought, I can't believe he does that. I, I can't believe he lives like that. And I, I, I watched and it's, there's no stopping. Praise God. Amen. I got news for you. 
Not everybody's going that way. No, they're not. <clears throat> now I'm going to preach. Amen. God has put everything according to His order. I've already said it. You are not here today by accident. Amen. I told you already, God didn't need Paul in 1999. He needed you in 1999. Amen. He knew that as far as the stars is concerned, see, sailors used to use stars because they were fixed point of light. They didn't detour. They were there. And certain stars you could always count on because they never moved. And if you could just find that particular star, everything would be fine. And you could sail according to the northern star. And if you could just find it, at, and once the clouds passed by, you could see that light, everything would be fine. And everything, you could find direction because there was something that was fixed. It was put there by God to give direction to those who were traveling in the night. Amen. I got news for you, my friend, in this world right now. It is in darkness and it's getting darker every day that we live. Amen. It's corrupt. Our society is corrupt. Our nation is coming down. Amen. Don't clock out just yet. Amen. I said our nation's coming down. I don't care what you say. It's coming down. Amen. And I'll just tell you what I think, for whatever that matters, if we don't do justice in the situation we're in right now, it's going to be the last straw to break whatever faith that we have in the government of this nation. Amen. I personally think it's all part of the plan of God. Amen. I think that everything that's happening is by God's divine order to bring His church into its rightful position. Amen. You can get worried about it. I'm not. You can get fearful about everything I'm not, honey. I got news for you. God knew how dark it would be in 1999. But He said, I got something that's already fixed. I've got some stars in 1999. I've got them as fixed points of light. I put them into this order. I established them by my divine will. They're not going to move. They're not going to detour. They're not going to gravitate one way or the other. They're going to be right where I need them to be. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Wherever God puts you, shine. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You see, the devil has this unique way of deceiving and lying and tricking you into making you think, well, you know, there's nothing happening with where I'm at. I'm going to tell you a little story, all right? I'm going to tell you about three men who were students of the law and the prophets. And, and, and they'd studied it out. And one day they woke up and, and there was a sign in the heavens. We call them the magpies or we call them the three wise men. Amen. They, they understood the law and the prophets, but yet now in the heavens is a bright and a shining star. It was the responsibility of that star to lead those men to the sun. Amen. And so through their tedious journey, it wasn't just a weekend journey. It didn't take four or five days. Amen. It was weeks and months of traveling. It was getting up every morning thinking, I wonder how far the journey is going to take us today. I wonder if the star is going to shine again. It was their faith and trust in the fact that that star was not going to move. That star was a fixed point of light, leading them to the revelation, leading them to the understanding of who the Messiah really was. Amen. If somehow today you could see in the realm of the Spirit, you would see untold thousands that are coming out of denominationalism. You could see sinners right now that are looking at the Scriptures saying, i got to find Him. I've got to know where He's at. I need something to direct me. That's why I've come today to tell you, it ain't time to move. It ain't time to compromise. It ain't time to gravitate some other direction. It's time to shine. It's time to twinkle. It's time to be brilliant. God puts you here. God sets you in this order. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. All that would have taken is for that star to move just a little bit. Because light, well, I want to say this where you can understand it. Light, as far as we see it here, is much grander. Somebody's already talked about it, I think, with the Clark, about faith as far as we perceive as the mustard seed. 
But you see, it's so distant, it's so magnificent, it's so far, that if it moves just a little, the repercussions of it is not just a few inches, but it's millions of miles. All it would take him with the Clark is that star where he was at to move just a little and everything would have been off. And all it takes in the end time is for the church just to be off a little. And it's all off. That's how come I believe it from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I wish I'd have been here yesterday to hear Brother Oldham preach on the oneness. Because as far as I'm concerned, there is only one Lord. There is only one faith. There is only one baptism. Let me tell some of you something here. Let me, let me, let me tell some of you something. I'm, I want, especially some of you Bible school boys, I want to tell you something. Don't anybody ever tell you that there's many ways. And that there's many faiths. Amen. That very scripture in Ephesians, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord and one baptism, the Greek word there, is singular. It means one. But the word one faith, one, means first. It's a different Greek word. It actually words like this. There is singular Lord, there is a first faith, and there is a singular baptism. Jude wrote to us and said, There is a faith that was once delivered to the saints. From the time that it was delivered until now, he said it is to be contended for. He said there's only one faith. It's a first faith. It was the faith that was delivered on the day of Pentecost. I don't care what the Church of Christ say. I don't care what the Baptists say. I don't care what the Charismatics say. I don't care what the backslidden reprobate preacher says. There is a first faith. If you're going to preach something, you don't preach the sinner's prayer. You don't preach just mere believism. You've got to preach that first faith. I have a divine mandate from God. There is a first faith. What did Peter preach? I'll tell you what he preached. He preached repentance. He preached water baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He preached the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in tongues. That's exactly what he preached. That is the first faith. God has not changed that faith. We're still in the church age. We're still in the same dispensation. What it took to get in 2,000 years ago, it takes today. Nicodemus, except a man be born again of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. You must be born again. That's first faith. That is a fixed point of light. And if it ever moves, it's all off. The whole Bible's off. So I come to Church of Christ, come along and say, it ceased when that which is perfect is coming. That which is perfect is the completion of the canon, the New Testament, Scripture. You stupid jerk. What's wrong with your mind? Paul spoke in present tense and said, when that which is perfect is come, he said, I'll be here. Paul died 28 years before the completion of the New Testament, Scripture. I tell you what it is, you're nothing but full of unbelief. And you want the star to move to compromise your unbelief and to ratify what you think. I got news for you, and I don't care who says it. The day of miracles is not over, and the gifts of the Spirit have not ceased, and tongue talking has not stopped. We're still in the book of Acts. It's still being written right now. It hasn't changed and it hasn't moved. Now, say a second, I gotta hurry. I'm getting hungry. That's good for you. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Every, if they got up every day, they followed that star. Where's the star leading us? Well, it's leading you to a revelation. You know what? Some of you have heard this before. I'm gonna test some of you. You know where it led them? They went to Herod's palace. They thought, I believe he's the king of the Jews. He'll be found in the palace, and you know we'll go to the palace. It's led us to. Jerusalem, and surely he'll be found there. And they got to the palace, and where is he born, King of the Jews? And Herod said, Oh, really? Well, I don't know, but we're looking for him. 
we all want to come together and worship Him. I mean, after all, if you're looking for a king, surely you'll find him in the palace. And after all, if you're looking for God, a church is a church. Just find you a church and you'll find God. Find you a palace, you'll find the king. But I got news for you, just as he was not in that palace, there's some churches he ain't in today. He's got to be here. I mean, you know, and I'm telling you right now, they are sitting on pews right now thinking he ain't here. But Brother Clark, it's line up on line and precept upon precept. Hello there, Lou. I speak. God doesn't just turn the whole light switch on on you. He gives you a little bit and says, now let's see if you will obey it. And when you obey it, he says, I'm going to give you some more now. The ultimate thing is for all of that to lead you to a moment of revelation of Jesus Christ. My God. Well, some of them say, well, I've had an experience with God. I don't doubt your experience with God. I'm not questioning your experience with God. I don't have any doubt that you follow the star. But have you followed the star far enough? That's why when they got on the other side of Herod's palace, the Bible says, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. The star is still there. I got news for you. Some of them think church is church, and they're sitting on the pews right now, and they're thinking, my God's not here. What I'm looking for is not here. And in their mind, they're going, but this is the church. This is all there is. But in their quest, the moment they step out on the other side of their denominationalism and they look around, all of a sudden, that light's there. That revelation is there. That fixed point of light is there saying, come on, you haven't found him yet. But if you'll keep coming this way, you will find him. Woo! And here they come. I can see them now there at Bethlehem knocking on the door. And little Mary answers the door. And two-year-old Jesus is peeking around him. And, and she says, can I help you? They said, ma'am, this is a strange request. But we are here looking for the Christ. He who was born King of the Jews. Is he here? Amen. Yes, he's here. He's standing right here in front of you right now. i got news for some of you. The moment that you find Jesus, he may not be as old as you think he ought to be. He may not be as mature as you think think he ought to be. But if you'll stay close to him, he grows and matures. I'm not talking about him as far as understanding. I'm talking about your understanding of him. It was in an infant way that I found him. But through the years, I've watched him grow. Through the years, I've seen him get stronger. Through the years, I've seen him get wiser. Is it that he grew? No. It's the way that he revealed himself to me. I got news for some of you right now. You may not be all together what you thought it would be. But if you'll just hang around, if you'll just stay around, there's revelation. There's understanding. There's knowledge coming. You may find him when he's only two. But he'll grow. That's how come I cannot understand for the life of me how somebody can come into the church and the only understanding they have about God is that He's a Savior. And people that's been in church for years that have found Him not just to be a Savior, but a keeper and a guide and a protector and a provider and a deliverer and a healer and a way maker. And some new convert that's rocking a little two-year-old Jesus is out shouting you, uh -uh. you need to bring your maturity to the house of God and you need to exalt Him and say, He gets sweeter as the days go by. He gets greater as the moments fly. I gotta hurry, my God, I gotta hurry. <laughs> Don't get me excited now. Let me tell you something. I wanna know one thing. What would have happened to those men if that light would have moved? What some of you don't see and what some of you don't understand is you're a star. And God has placed you in this world as a fixed point of light to lead people to a greater light. People are watching you that you don't even know about. 
They are. There's people watching the church right now, Brother Clark. We don't even, we don't even, they're watching our stands. They're watching our positions. I don't care what the Methodists are doing in Sacramento. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Hundreds of them flying in there to rally around this preacher that decides that he's going to put his blessing on gay unions. And they just had a big, they can't call it a marriage, but a union. And all these Methodist preachers and laity come flying in to support it, saying we've took a hard stand against it for years. It's time to back up. This is the 90s. Go ahead, star. Start wondering. Where will you stop? I thank God I heard my general superintendent say what he said last night. I got news for you the moment that the United Pentecostal Church starts saying that there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. I got news for you. We will not stop there. We'll just keep wondering. We'll keep wondering, 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 wondering. And then the new birth will not be essential. And baptism will not be essential. And you can just say a sinner's prayer. Or you can believe in Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad or whoever. And everything's fine. There's all kinds of ways that lead you to the same God. Come on, we're all trying to worship the same God. It doesn't matter. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end is death and destruction thereof. But Jesus stood in the 14th chapter of St. John and said, I am the way! Let me ask some of you a question. What are you going to do when you start changing and you go to the family reunion and you bobbed your hair all off and painted your face all up? Huh? What are you going to do, sir, when you show up in your shorts and tank top or halter top or whatever? Well, I don't guess men wear those. Well, I know some of them do. Amen. You don't believe me? Come to San Francisco. Praise God. <laughs> what, what are you going to do when you show up? And all of a sudden, uh, you, you start telling everybody, what I've told you all these years doesn't matter. And old cousin Joe over here sitting there thinking, I've been watching you for all these years. I've been trying to come to God. And you were the only fixed point of light I had in my life. And now you're moving. How do I find him? How do I get to him? You need to plant your feet right now and make up your mind. I ain't budging. I'm not moving. It ain't time to change. There are thousands of them coming right now. And they're watching the church. And the only fixed point of light they got is the church. Huh? Preacher, what are you going to say to those folks when you've taught them all these years? It's wrong for you to go to movies and it's wrong for you to go to sports. Well, that's the way they used to preach it when I was a kid. Now I know things have changed now. Now, now. now you don't go to movies, you just bring them home with you. <laughs> I, won't, I won't get on that. I'll lose a few friends. Well, well, well. Now, what are you going to start saying to people? How, how are you going to look those people in the face that you've told all these years and they told their kids, that's a man of God. And he's preaching the truth and all of a sudden you walk to the pulpit and you start telling people, we don't have to do that now. I'm going to tell you what happened to that preacher. Jude picked it up. He said, he is a wandering star. Run after the greed of Balaam. I'm going to tell some of you something. Turn the table off just one second. Circumcised, which is a type of baptism, to obtain what I want. Not that I have faith in it. Not that I believe in the seal or the symbol. But I'll go ahead and do it to get what I want. And they'll do it because they run after the greed of Balaam just to get what they want. And we got UBC preachers following right after them. And they're just wandering as fast as they can go. And they're hot on their trail. You want to believe in somebody. You want somebody to be a... What can I say, a mentor or a hero to you? Don't go looking in the Charisma magazine to find somebody that don't know what they believe. Find you a red-hot apostolic preacher that believes this message and say, he's my mentor. That's what I want to be like. You start following that stuff, you'll follow all the way to hell. But you better get a hold of somebody that's still preaching what they preached when they first started. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. That's what you better find. That's what you better believe in. 
You listen to enough of that junk, they'll get in your brain, they'll get in your mind, and you'll start making excuses where they're annoying. And so was Balaam. One of these days in the UPC, we're going to wake up and understand anointing is not the seal of approval. Fruit! Fruit! The seal of approval. You'll know them by the fruit they bear, not because they are anointed. I know some of you don't believe this, but I believe a drunk can be anointed. What's happened to us, we get a few people in our rank and file that gets a little anointing on them, and ooh, they got to be a man of God. They called somebody out and told them what was wrong with them, so they got to be a great man of God. I'm not knocking that ministry. I believe in it. But I'm talking about fruit. I call this man, and I'm, see, I don't hardly ever, but I just feel it on me today. Told me about a man, if I called his name, everybody here would know him. And oh, great, oh, this is a prophet. And they told me, I heard him say it. But Shad Walker, you, you were with me. Yeah, we had to go to him and tell him to quit misleading people in the sinner's prayer. He's going to preach in UPC. He had to preach Acts 238. He don't believe it. The man doesn't believe it. Now, folks, maybe I'm a little old-fashioned, but where I come from, that's the dividing line. You don't believe in Acts 238? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But you are not, I'm going to, should I say it? You are not my brother. If you're going to be my brother, you got to be born. And the way I see it, the only way to be born is to be born again. And when you're born again of the water and the Spirit, you're my brother. We're the household of faith. But until you're born again, i got news for you. You may be my friend, and you may be my associate. And you may say, I'm a Christian, but you are not a brother yet. See, all this... Can I preach a little longer? All this stuff is nothing more but them trying to get you to move. What I don't understand is, here they are in the denominationalism saying, they're coming... There's got to be more. Here's the apostolic saying, we need to move. My God. Can I talk about it just for a moment? Make that sit down a second. Turn the tape back on. I'm through. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the sermon. But let me tell you what's going on. There is tremendous pressure on everybody right now to move you. Because here's the way God looks at it. If you can be moved, I'm going to move you. And so it's God that lets the pressure come to see if you're going to stand. The devil will. He ain't nothing but a puppet on the strings of God. And God gets ready to see if he can move you. He goes, come here, devil. Come here, boy. Don't you hate to be called boy? Come here, boy. Over here. I want you to beat up on Keith Clark a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Now, <coughs> I don't want to say this and it sound contradictory. But not all stars have the same energy. Now, how am I going to explain that? Will you just give me a few, a little time to explain this? Really, this is what I really want. To. The greater the light, the more resistance and pressure. Some of you say, you get a prayer in the altar. God, I want an apostolic ministry. You don't even know what you're praying. What, no, what you want is what you see as a result. That's not apostolic ministry. That's the result of apostolic ministry. That's not apostolic ministry. Apostolic ministry is over here. When you're not at salt, and you're not on the campus, and Brother Clark's not around, and you're all by yourself, and the devil shows up and says, we don't fight. Because the devil 
and he starts hitting. And you start reeling and rocking. And all of a sudden, he says, I got friends coming. Because you think, I think I can take him. This is one on one. But the devil don't fight. And about the time you think you're going to take him, here comes hell. And they got you down, beating the stuffings out of him. And you're thinking, where is God? Because you know what we do? We put all of our premise on what we feel. See, Brother, Brother Kraft is talking about those dimensions. I believe that's so strong. A lot of people dwell in the emotional arena totally. They've yet to learn how to get into that area of the spirit where it's still. I want to talk about this. Now, we need and the devil said, if you would just quit being so dogmatic. Remember what that family told you the other day? They really liked the music of your church. And, oh, they liked your preaching as long as you didn't get on that doctrinal stuff. And he owns the gas station down on the corner. Oh, I wonder how much he could have put it on. Some of you can relate to I'm talking about some of you here. And he just beating the air for 11 daylights out of you. And you don't even think God exists. You know, like with the crash, you want to show the map where you're at. And you're like, what in the world? And the wind starts blowing. And the pressure is on. And the devil says, move. Just move out of there. Devil, I'm going to move. If I move, it's all. I have only one responsibility. Not twinkle toes. Twinkle. Are you relating to what I'm talking about right now? Can anybody? Because here's what I want. Here's what I want to say. Peter picks this up, and he talks about we have received a more sure word of prophecy until the day star shines. I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to twist, I don't want to twist it in the second sermon. That short word of prophecy, I believe, deals with some of the Old Testament. But when you really study that, Robertson's words, especially marriage to that, it is a word of prophecy. The reason why for Clark that some men shine more than others, does that sound egotistical? Do you understand what I'm saying? Not praying that it's not that you're better that you have more energy. The reason why is because your amount of energy is predicated upon prophecy. What God has spoken to you. See, prophecy in Scripture is like light. Is this making sense? And when God speaks into your spirit, Brother Clark, that revelation, that prophecy becomes your energy and you begin to burn with it. My God. Now, I've talked to people about things God's told me and I said, I might as well be talking to that microphone. They don't have the foggiest idea. They aren't relating. They think I fell out of a tree on my head. I've preached, I've preached in churches and got to preach it. Well, I feel it's getting on me right now. And I pre and I said, they don't even believe what I'm saying. I've told some I'm talking to some of you pastors now. I told saints, I said, you don't believe what I'm saying. You won't see it. It'll pass you by. Let me explain to you what's going on. When that sure word of prophecy comes to a man and he stands in the pulpit and preaches. It is a fixed point of light to ultimately lead you unto the illumination of a noonday sun where God is in His fulfillment. But people fail to understand that. Paul, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, makes reference to the fact the reason why that Israel could not go in is because they would not mingle or mix the faith with what was being preached. 
one of the worst things you could find is a Pentecostal church that they just sit there and let the preacher preach. There's nothing more pathetic or worse than just a Pentecostal church sitting there and letting you preach. Or sitting there like they're judging what you were saying. What they don't understand is God has put you into their life as a fixed point of light. You are there to lead them to where God finally reveals it in its fullness. I guarantee you if I started listening to the name of the ten spies that come back with an evil report, none of you would know their names. And what got Israel in trouble is when they come back and gave an evil report. They had to choose between following wandering stars or a fixed point of light. They chose to follow something that would cause them to wander for 40 years and perish in the wilderness. I got news for you about this apostolic revival. I don't care how much you've heard it preached. I don't care if you've been around since Methuselah was a boy. I don't care if you've heard it preached for thousands of years. I got news for you. The worst thing that can happen to you is for you to get a spirit of unbelief on you that says, Well, I've heard it, 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 but it hasn't happened yet. I'm telling you, you follow that star until it comes until its fullness. What do... What's the purpose of the star? It leads you till the sun comes up. What's the purpose of a star? To get you through the night. I tell you, well, finally when the sun comes up, you can see in the fullness. You can see things as they really are. But all some of you have to go on today is just a sure word of prophecy. The only thing you got to stand on is just that night when you were in prayer, when God spoke to you and said, I'm going to bring revival to your church. I'm going to bring them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. I'll bring in the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the whoremongers. I'll bring in the doctors, the lawyers. I'll bring them up. I'll bring them down. I'll bring them from every walk of life. I'll shake this place. I'll bring light into darkness. And when you, listen to me preacher, I'm telling you what's trying to happen. Their unbelief is like a wind blowing to you. And it's trying to move you off of the prophecy. It's trying to get you to move your position. But you don't understand. Once you move off of it a little, it's all off. You know why Jesus went to Calvary? Two reasons. First, he was persuaded that his dying would shed blood that was powerful enough to forgive the worst person. You ready? And then he was persuaded that death wasn't powerful enough to hold him. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. You know why we got a church? And I'm persuaded I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God is persuaded, why don't you get persuaded? Let's say it again, ready? The three, the three greatest words in life. Thank you. It's not God is love. It's I am persuaded God loves me. It's not God is able to heal. It's I am persuaded God will heal me. Uh, we've had such moves of the Holy Ghost here. And yet somehow God has said to my heart, tell these people the greatest thing they'll get out of this whole conference is to walk out of here with an innate persuasion. So, uh, I got a word for you. Some of you got prayed for. Some of you got anointed. Some of you got spit all over. Somebody slapped you around and you didn't get your healing. The Lord told me to tell you, tell my people, sometimes my healing comes as a seed. And they want a full harvest. That's a miracle. But miracles are not always given to people. But healing comes as a seed. What does that mean? You better be persuaded the seed can be stolen. 
You better water it. You better protect it. You better nurture it. You better pray over it. You better bless it. You better encourage it. You better talk to it. You better be persuaded that the miracle is in the seed.